This Grand Cherokee came in for alignment, and what the driver described is a brake pulsation. Now listen to this. This sound, what sounds peculiar about this? A brake pulsation that keeps pulsating even after I let off the brakes. That sounds strange to you? It sounded like a, a kind of anomalous, but that's how I wrote it up. So she left it with us, and we, I grabbed one of the guys, and we launched our diagnosis. Now, the first thing I noticed, we started in a service bay, was it was idling really high. Uh, you know, what's this, what, what, this would fall under the category of check for related symptoms. You understand what I'm saying? All right, so I wondered if the foot feed was fouled by a wrinkle format. I've seen that more than once. So, sent him to fetch a scan tool, and we retrieved the diagnostic trouble code, and we found only a PO455, which is no surprise on one of these, but it had nothing to do with what we were seeing. PO455, active evaporative leak monitor, large leak detected. You know, it's a hose that split or they left the gas cap off or whatever when after they gas it up. We proceeded to hack into the live data where we noticed that the reported throttle position sensor voltage was a lot higher than the baseline minimum. And that would explain the high idle. You see, what happens at Keon is the PCM looks at throttle position closed voltage. The PCM stores closed voltage for the rest of that drive cycle. The minimum TPS, 0.84. All right, so whatever it sees, it's going to say that's closed throttle. OK? In this particular case, what we were seeing here Anytime the TP is above that closed voltage, the throttle angle is considered at part throttle. And it handles things differently than the throttle position that says, is at part throttle. On the older carbureted vehicles, there was a dash pot. And what that was is a little thing that when you gave it the gas, the throttle would come back and it would let the throttle come back slowly. Well, these uh, idle air control systems do the same thing. The PCM program to have a dash pot function, so when you let off, it won't stall the engine. All right. So, as long as the TPS is considered to be at part throttle, the idle air control will remain at this dash pot function letting extra air go in there. And that makes for a fast idle on a non-electronic throttle body system, even with the throttle plate closed. Uh, one of those electronic throttle bodies where it uses a motor to drive the throttle plate. This one right here, it's got idle air control. All right, so we tap on the throttle, you know, which is almost reflexes when the idle is high like that, and the idle more or less normalized. And so we backed out of the shop for a test drive. We're heading down the road. When we cleared the runway, wheels up and locked, we reached cruising speed on the four lane and slowed it the first turnaround and check out the brake pulsation. Didn't feel a brake pulsation, but we did feel the engine feeling like it was in too high of a gear. You know what I'm saying? You ever feel that whenever you had the engine in a gear that was slightly too high of a gear, if you drive it a stick, it'll labor and hunker down? All right, the transmission was in high gear and continued to quiver in labor even after we let off the brake. This is what she was talking about. We had to parse this and figure it out. Then it dropped back to low gear when we were almost stopped. We duplicated the concern and we verified it. Now we got to determine what's causing that. With the TPS reading like it was, we reasoned that the PCM might indeed be confused enough so that it was not dropping it into the lower gear because of the TPS. You see, the TPS was reading a higher throttle angle. They thought you were still trying to drive a little bit. So this would be a fairly easy beginning to throw a TP sensor on it, or so we thought. The first crew came out just fine. The next one really two torx bits, and we pulled the throttle body off, put it in the vise, and we ground the head off the screw and got the TP sensor off. But even when we heated the boss with the propane torch, the screw wouldn't budge. So we got our trusty heat gun. The well, heat gun is like an overrated hair dryer that will just blister or something. Matter of fact, I was using a heat gun to take a sticker off the door glass out there and broke it the other day because that heat gun's really hot. Anyway, when I put a heat gun on it, we grabbed it with them. See how we just strip it thing trying to get it out of there with a wire? Finally got it to screw out of there. And we managed to replace that screw and put it back in. Not only did the idle normalize, but the transmission did too. So this is a sort of came in written up as a brake problem and it turned out to be a transmission problem. Okay? We had figured out as we went along. Now, if you just drive it feeling for a brake pulsation, didn't feel a brake pulsation, and said, well, it's got other stuff wrong with it, but she didn't write. You know, you got to be able to think outside the box in a situation like this. This is Justin's toolbox in his old truck. Now, Justin, this is, he graduated a while back, and he's working at a big Ford dealer down in 
Florida now. And, uh, he showed up every day. When, Joe, when he was here, this is an interesting uh, distinction. When, when he was here, he would show up first thing in the morning. And I usually gave him really good work to do, you know, and he'd show up first thing in the morning, he'd go right to work. Now, the one thing that did happen, there was another guy that was here that would show up later, and for some strange reason, when he showed up, Justin would quit working. <laughs> and they'd shoot the bull standing outside the door. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Bad company corrupts good morals, you know what I'm going with that? But anyway, the long and the short of it was, he learned how to do that, you know, all of this stuff by being here, and then he went to work, and he's, you know, doing pretty well for himself now. Uh, at the time that I originally built the video, he had that nasty toolbox and everything. Uh, but he's intelligent enough. This is the thing. He buys the best box he can pay cash for. At the time, he bought that one at Harbor Freight. Nothing wrong with that. So he's not running a high cab on the tool truck. He is smart. No use of going into debt when you don't have to. He says, I pulled two motors this week along with all the other stuff that come in. Five, four, three valve and F-150. Exhaust manifold stuff broke off in the head, took the body off, threw the motor, put everything back together, ran good, and went out the door. This is him working in the shop every day. Second was a Taurus with no compression, yanked out in a leak test. Won't hold pressure in the cylinders, time to slip, bent valve, waiting on the hot line to tell us what he wants to do. So, I mean, this is basically his, his daily work. He had it together in school, and so having it together at work was an easy transition for him. And if you don't have your priorities right in school, you'll have to change a lot whenever you go to work, or you will get fired. Some days just aren't fun. Don't watch the clock, deal with it, do your job, and work through it. Okay? All right. What's wrong with this picture? Somebody tell me what's wrong with this picture. Look at the picture very carefully and tell me what you see that would raise a red flag. Not particularly. What do you see? Anybody hasn't seen it yet, huh? Is it just passing it? What do you see? Somebody better see this and tell me what's wrong with this. Because y'all can see this as good as I can. Huh? What is this? It's dirt. It's dirt. It's schooling pins all over. That was the first thing you call it. And I said. I did not hear you say that. You weren't talking loud enough because I'm old and I can't hear good. Okay. All right. What's wrong with this picture? The caliper. The bore the brakes out so bad that it blew the caliper piston. Blew it slam out of there, and uh, there was nothing left of those brakes at all. Uh, all right. What about this one? We got a, we we got the same thing going on. We got clogged up with dirt right here. We got the boot torn. We got all, this is a bit of mud truck. You know what I mean? And remember what I told you about the mud trucks. Whenever they throw a bunch of mud and stuff up in on the inside of the frame rail, and those uh, brakes uh, lines are buried in that uh, wet dirt all the time, and they start to rust, one of these days you're going to put your foot on the brake and it's going to blow one of them brake lines, and the brake pedal going to go down to the floor like you're stepping on a plum. Oh. And that's not a good feeling whenever you're trying to stop uh, in downtown Pagosa Springs. All right. What's wrong with this picture? Very good. What do we need to do to fix it? Clean it, but don't use uh, here. Uh, huh? What do you mean? You think the only problem is that it's dirty? Um, yeah, no, but you got to clean the dirt. We got to clean the dirt to be able to see the colors. I know right now what's wrong with it. And cleaning the dirt is something you got to do, but that's secondary to understanding as soon as you look at it what's wrong with it. That wheel cylinder is leaking. And I'm already telling my customer, we need to do your brakes, and we're going to have to put at least one wheel cylinder on here. It wouldn't be a bad idea to put two. Wheel cylinders don't cost that much. We don't rebuild them in the shop much anymore. Uh, back in the 70s, I would always rebuild the wheel cylinder. We did them every time we did the brakes, we'd rebuild the wheel cylinder. With rebuilding the wheel cylinder now, it's silly because it's fairly easy to pop another one on there. 
in most cases. You right. can tell it's leaking water because it's pumped up like that? Ma'am? How do you tell that it's leaking by looking at it? Because it's wet right there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, if the whole thing's wet and you don't know if it's rear end grease coming out of the rear end on a pickup or this, uh, what's the best way to tell if it's brake fluid or gear grease? Just looking at a nasty situation like this where it's all wet, how do you how can you tell if it's gear grease or brake fluid? Anybody know? Taste of it. Oh. Can you just smell it? Your tongue is washable. All you gotta do is get a little bit on your finger. You can't smell it. Just tap it to your tongue. You'll instantly know if it's brake fluid or gear grease. People that work in this business every day will do that all day long. I do that to see if a, if I see something if I see wet in the floorboard and I and I taste of it and it's sweet. I know it's antifreeze and I need a heater for it. You got it. If it's not, then I know it's got something to do with either rain leak or evaporation. It sounds silly, but that's, uh, you know, don't, CJ, you know what, the best crazy. idea I could give you, if you're doing this kind of work, you don't need to be a wuss, okay? All right. What about this one here? Do I not see any linings here? No. All right, let me back up. What kind of system is this? Is this dual servo or leading trailing? How do you know it's leading trailing? The adjuster, you run under the master cell, you see that adjuster? That's how you know it's leading trailing. All right, what kind is this? That is dual servo, that's right. Which side is this on? Left or right? How do you know? Because it's, I don't know, just All right. What else is wrong with this picture? Is there any lining left on these brake shoes? There ain't nothing but the metal. That's metal to metal stuff there, man. Now this is the one that you don't know if it's gear grease or brake fluid. Typically when it's that bad and that greasy, now that one's not, not a good picture. That was a fuzzy one. But that particular thing is most likely going to be an, an axle leak, but you still got to have to do the brake. And uh, I would like to take this one here and put it on a stand and pull a wheel off and use the pressure washer on it, you know, because you're going to take, you're going to do a lot of work in the shop, you know, you can do that with brake parts cleaner, but you're probably going to use four cans of it, you know. All right, what's wrong with this one here? There's no brake pad in there. You can see the rotor all the way through there. Hey, look at that. See this? What's that little plate? See how the brake pad is so far gone that that little, yeah, that little uh, insulation plate is slid down? That's nasty, isn't it? It came in for a brake noise. Squealing. Squealing all the time, actually. What's wrong with this one? Is that a light? Is that a light? No. This 2007 GMC had been at one of the local GM dealers to have the power steering pump replaced and it came to us with all this stuff dangling. Uh, the new, the destroyed fluid level sensor is what that is. And by the master set was hanging there and the inline connector that wasn't anchored or even routed right in our initial visual inspection found this. One of the things that always boggled my mind there was a guy one time that came with working over there. He had a snap-on toolbox when he came there that was that wide and that tall. You had to stand on a step stool to see what was in the top of the toolbox. Slam full of tools. I don't know how much money it was. $75,000 worth of snap-on tools in the toolbox. And there's this uh, Mustang that he worked on for something. You know, we had specialty groups over there. I don't even remember what he was supposed to have done to it, but he worked under the hood and did something. And then they gave it to me for check engine light or whatever. And I noticed that there was a little solenoid, like this one right here, that was swinging by the wires and wasn't even bolted to the bracket. So I called that guy over here and I said, what is this swinging by the wires for and not bolted to the bracket? You know what he said? Oh, that's the way I found it. What's wrong with that statement? 
Yeah. If you're a mechanic, you put the thing back like it's supposed to be so that when somebody comes along and you know, they'll say, you know, somebody that knew what they were doing worked on this or somebody that didn't give a rip. They had fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of tools and we don't know where you got them from. You know what I mean? And, you know, there's all kinds of people out there that are claiming to be super duper mechanics that can't fix a ham sandwich. At least that's what I'm hearing from people in the field that are trying to hire folks. So uh, y'all don't need to be one of those, okay? All right. Then. What's wrong with this one? Somebody look at that scan tool screen and tell me where the trouble is. Do you know what kind of problem that caused? It didn't have an ABS light on, believe it or not. It caused it whenever she would take off, her traction control light would come on because it thought she was spinning one of the wheels. The car was actually going two miles an hour, and one of the wheel speed sensors were even 21. Now you'll see that slide again whenever we start talking about wheel speed sensors. It came to our door with a low power concern. Another shop had put pinpointed the problem with the fuel pump, but I felt a misfire. So with a misfire, the truck drove poorly like something was holding it back. The brakes had a nasty pulsation, and when we pulled it into the service lake, I could feel heat radiating from the front loaders. My temperature gun showed that the discs were at 450 degrees. You can cook some meat like that. What should they be at? Huh? What should they be at? They shouldn't be 450. You might see them, running, you might see them 150, 175. You know, if you've been stopping really hard a whole bunch of times, they might be a couple hundred degrees. But that was twice as high as they ever would be. Among the other things, the park brake cables were frozen. These brake shoes were a disaster. And it pays to look at everything when you're doing brakes. Just look at all of it. If you got one that's in that bad of shape, look at all of it. They've been driving this one through the creek. And it had rusted everything. They spent a lot of the time driving through the creek. I don't know why. But it had been driven repeatedly through high water and mud and left to stew in those juices. So we found the wheel cellar showing leakage inside their dust boots. The wheel cellars would need to be replaced. Thanks to the road hard and put up wet, happened to the owner of the flare nuts on the brake lines fed the wheel cylinders were frozen solid. You couldn't even get them off of ice grips. It was nasty. Alright, so another problem with the flare nuts was they were a size larger on the outside threads than normal. Alright, so that's a bigger pole than that one. The outside threads on that nut was the same size threads you would see on a quarter inch brake line, but these were 3 16 lines. And so the outside threads of the flare nuts, they just wasn't going to work. If you put the new wheel cylinder on there, uh, the brake line, you know, they didn't have the nuts. You couldn't get the nuts. Or at least at the time, they didn't have them at the park store. And so what I did was I got wheel cylinders for a 98 Ranger, which were just right, except for that. And that way I was able to use standard brake lines to do it. See, that's an outside the box thinking thing. We're talking about problem solving skills and critical thinking, you know what I mean? How can we fix this safely where it will work like it's supposed to? And there was nothing wrong with that repair. We wound up fixing it right up like it was like it should have been. And it was not as simple as just cutting the line, but anyway. Uh, brake lines are small because they got a whole thousands of pounds of pressure. Two thousand pounds of pressure in your brake lines when you're standing on the brakes getting hard. And if it's like that, it gets thinner when it rusts and they can fail without warning. So know how to fix them the right way. Double flare. That's the right way. I got a sheet out here. I got some brand new tubing that's not hard to work with. It's that nickel stuff that we that everybody's using nowadays. It won't rust. And it's also, it'll hold the pressure. It's good for brakes, but it's also easier to work with than a large steel stuff that was flared at the factory. But the tubing union is not the right way to fix brake lines. Do not do that. This is the right way to do it. That's the wrong way to do it. You see, you've got a, a flare union and you've got two flare nuts. And that will take care of the brake line. This right here, that's not going to blow apart if you do a panic stop. And that's really, really nasty. All right. Now make sure you know what kind of flare you have. The one on the left is bubble flare. These are incompatible. You, know, you might even notice the nut looks different on that one than it does that one. Okay? But remember, some of you guys have got worksheets on this stuff. And I, okay, I've got this stuff and i got some new line out there for you to do that. Now some of you guys, y'all did brake lines on that... Uh, on that old, rusty old Impala last time until you blew in the face, didn't you? I mean, y'all did brake line after, but they had replaced every brake line on that Impala, every single one of them. And that's nothing to sneeze at. They got it done. All right.
That's the end of the slideshow. Okay, so are you all ready for the pop test? Hmm? I'm ready. You're ready? I'm ready for Tell me something you, you learned that you didn't know before. What was incompatible? The bubble fair and the uh... The bubble fair and the double fair incompatible. Mm -hmm. Alright, that was the last slide. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was the problem with that? What was the problem with the Grand Cherokee? Yeah. Yeah, why, what was the TP sensor doing yeah, specifically? Yeah, the one two miles five was read 21 on the right wheel. <laughs> or the right wheel right right sensor. You got your cars mixed up. No, that, that was that. That was that. Uh, it was reading too high of voltage. Oh, it didn't know oh. you let off. It didn't know you had let off the gas, and it wasn't shifting down. Oh, that's what it yeah, amounted to. I thought they were talking about that. That, 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 that other one was about that lady brought the car and her right wheel was reading too high. Yeah, circuit. that was a Pontiac <laughs> Montana that we worked on, and it was and her, her traction control would kick in, and it would you know make jumpy. And a, and a TC light would come on, and we actually got the scan tool and put on it and got to looking. It needed a bearing and a hub on the right side because there was something wrong down there. That was causing that to read. So, uh, all right. Everybody aware of what's going on? So, you guys are uh, you know, keep up with your worksheets. I, you know, I put some next ones out here too. And, uh, you know, don't take that lightly, you know, because you can actually wind up. How many of you know you can get in serious trouble at the end of the semester if your worksheets aren't done? Mm. You know what I mean? There you go, because they keep coming, don't they? They just keep they coming. Don't stop. They don't stop. Yeah. You know? A lot of the times, in the course of doing the work, you wind up doing the worksheets anyway. You can remember the stuff that you did, you know. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing the thing about it. I'm not hard to get along with, but I'm not going to give you a passing grade just because I like you. You know what I mean? That's why we have one student that's not here this time that would have been if he hadn't, you know, been irresponsible and bombed out. You know, so anyway, just make sure that you remember the right way to keep your head above water. And also, uh, when you're doing a fix of some kind, it seems like it's a sort of an unorthodox fix, like putting a different wheel cylinder on there. You know, make sure that you do everything in a safe. There's some things you don't need to, to uh, modify. One of the things you don't need to modify, I'm always talking about, is don't ever modify cruise control. Don't ever modify an airbag system because you don't want it lighting off somebody's face. You know, there's some things, if you just think about it, if I modify this and it cra it goes bad on me, who's going to, you know, we're going to get in some trouble? You know, don't modify brakes, you know, using duct tape and bailing wire. You know, everything needs to be put back just like it's supposed to go. You think? I use duct tape to move crap lines. Yeah. <laughs>